Thank you all for joining us today for a conversation with the American Council on Education. The American Council on Education has played a major role in shaping higher education in the United States for more than a century. Since its founding in 1918, ACE has spearheaded programs, advocated for legislation and effective public policy, and led initiatives that have shaped the nation's post-secondary landscape. ACE is committed to affirming and strengthening public trust in post-secondary education, championing post-secondary education's role in social and economic mobility, and enriching the capacity of institutions and leaders to innovate and adapt. It is my privilege to welcome our guests from ACE. As a reminder, I am Heather Perfetti, President of the Commission, and I will ask John and Heidi to introduce themselves. Thank you, Heather. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here today and, and certainly want to thank everyone who's joining us uh, for this session. Um, as Heather mentioned, you know we are here from the American Council on Education. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what I do at ACE. I am currently the Senior Vice President for Government Relations and National Engagement at ACE. Uh, and functionally, what that means is I oversee ACE's advocacy work, uh, that work that Heather talked about, where we attempt to uh, represent the interests of colleges and universities before the federal government, whether that's both branches of Congress, the administration and the administrative agencies, uh, and certainly the federal courts as well. Uh, because AC is the umbrella association, we cover everything that impacts colleges and universities. So that is the things you would expect, student financial aid, institutional support, um, scientific research performed on college campuses, but it's also a lot of things that people don't necessarily associate with higher education, things like labor law and healthcare policy and sustainability, all those things that impact colleges and universities because we are not just educational institutions. Uh, we're also huge employers. We are uh, very active in things like athletics and student life, and we have law enforcement facilities. So when you think about everything a college or university does, uh, the footprint they have in their community, uh, as you can imagine, there's a huge level of interaction with state, local, and certainly federal policy. Um, that means that we work a lot with a lot of other organizations. In fact, we have about 200 organizations that are not colleges and universities who are AC members, including middle states. Uh, and it means that we are working constantly on behalf of those uh, and in partnership with those organizations uh, to advance the policy interests that we have. I mentioned very briefly that AC historically has focused solely on the federal level, uh, and much of our work has been in that area. But recently, uh, we have seen some changes in the policy environment for colleges and universities that necessitated us looking uh, beyond the Beltway. And for, <laughs> for that, we have Heidi leading that work, and I'll let her introduce herself and talk a little bit about what she does at AC. Thanks, John. And thank you, Heather, and everybody for including me in today's webinar event. Um, my name is Heidi Sue. I am the Assistant Vice President for National Engagement at ACE, which I can get into later in our formal presentation, but it's a new function for ACE um, in recognition of state-based challenges that have been growing across the country that are related to higher ed policy. Um, I'm really glad to be here. We are a relatively new office within ACE's Government Relations Department designed to work collaboratively with the range of expertise at ACE across government relations, but also research data and our outreach team. So I'm really looking forward to today's webinar and happy to jump into the discussion. So we'll go ahead and move to John's presentation. Thank you. Yes, and, and thanks again, Heather. Um, Heidi and I were talking about how we wanted to uh, go over the national environment for higher education, and it fits sort of neatly between our two areas of responsibility. Uh, I am going to start by kind of laying out the landscape for higher education at the federal level, and then I'll turn it over to Heidi for uh, really uh, more of an examination of what we're seeing at the state level. 
uh, as well as some other issues around the Office of National Engagement. Um, but I think the first thing to think about when we think about the moment higher education finds itself in is that we are in an election cycle. We are in an incredibly important election cycle. Um, in Washington, every election cycle is important. Uh, members are constantly thinking about the next election. Uh, but this year, it's it's more meaningful. Uh, first and foremost, we have a presidential election, uh, a somewhat unusual presidential election for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that we have a rematch between candidates. Does not happen that often. Uh, two, and maybe more importantly, for trying to think about what we may see, we have two candidates who are both unpopular with voters, who both poll underwater when asked voters' opinions of them. Uh, that's relatively unusual uh, in American presidential politics. It was the situation we saw in 2016. What that really means is, you know, a presidential election can always be tricky, but when you have these dynamics, what you tend to see is a lot less predictability. Um, when you have two candidates who are essentially uh, equally <laughs> unpopular in many ways, what you tend to see is that the party affiliation determines most of the states. And what we're really looking at is six states that seem to be the competitive battlegrounds. And even within those six states, you're not talking about large shifts in the population. Really, what we saw in 2016 was a handful of states, saw it again in 2022, for that matter, a handful of states were 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 votes makes a big difference, may determine the outcome of the presidential election. So when you think about the pressures on that, that you're really looking at a microcosm of the electorate being able to influence the outcome, uh, the stakes of this presidential election, the stakes of how the parties message and present their candidates uh, is elevated. That's also very much true for Congress. We are in a situation right now where in the House of Representatives, Republicans hold the majority, but they only have a three vote lead effectively. Um, there's about 218 Republicans, about 213 Democrats with four absentee uh, members at the time, uh, four empty seats currently. Um, when you look at that, that really narrow margin, uh, what that means is that it is very hard to legislate. We have certainly seen that in the House of Representatives. In the Senate, the vote currently, the Democrats hold the majority with a 51-49 margin. Again, a very small margin. In this coming election, uh, Republicans in the House are very concerned because they have 18 seats that are up for re-election. Every seat in the House is up for re-election every cycle. Um, but 18 seats that Republicans hold that were won by Joe Biden in 2020. Uh, the fact that they have the majority is very much dependent on them having won those competitive seats uh, really in the middle of the election cycle. In the Senate, Republicans are looking at a two-seat deficit but they're also looking at an election in which 10 Republicans are up for re-election in relatively safe seats, whereas 24 Democrats are up for re-election, many of them in seats where either the incumbent has retired or that they were they're in states that are leaning uh, Republican. So both parties at this point are looking at those elections and thinking to themselves, excuse me, <clears throat> and thinking to themselves, they can control both parties of Congress if things break the right way. Uh, what that means is, again, the stakes of how they message, the stakes of what legislation may be considered in advance, all of them are done through the spectrum of how does this help us in November. Uh, and one of the things we've seen that's been a challenge for both parties is that, you know, I've talked mostly about the party breakdown, but when you look within the House of Representatives, when you look within the Senate, uh, the more important determining factor is not so much Republican versus Democrat as which part of the Republican Party we're talking about, which part of the Democratic Party we're talking about. Certainly the issues that Speaker McCarthy encountered were not because he'd lost the support of the majority of his caucus. Overwhelming number of Republicans in the House voted to retain him as Speaker, uh, but enough of a small minority of his party voted to oust him that he was kicked out of the Speakership. First time that has ever happened. You're seeing the same dynamics with Speaker Johnson. He has those 18 moderate members who, if they don't get reelected because they ran on a platform that might be considered too conservative for a moderate district, they will lose the majority. But on the other side, and as we'll see in a second, the bulk of his party is much more in safe seats, very conservative. Same dynamic is true for Democrats between the progressive wing and the moderate wing of the Democratic Party. If we could go to the next slide, please. And this is what I was just talking about. If you look at the composition of the House of Representatives right now, 
Uh, and this is the Cook Political Report. This is their prognostications about which seats, uh, essentially safe seats versus toss-ups. And that gray in the middle, those 21 seats, those are the toss-up seats. Those are the seats that are actively in competition. You sometimes get some uh, unexpected outcomes from the lean column, the likely column. The solid ones are very, very safe. And that's where the bulk of both parties are. This means a couple different things. One is, of course, control of those that 21 in the middle determines who's in charge of each chamber, so in this case, the House. Uh, but what it also means is the overwhelming majority of your members are very much opposed to the views of the people in that middle section. They're in safe seats. Their biggest fear is not that they will lose those seats. Their biggest fear is that if they are uh, you know, too far to the middle for their party, Democratic or Republican, uh, that they will face a primary challenger who is either more progressive or more conservative than there. They will lose the possibility of being reelected uh, because they weren't out at the edge where, which is what most of their constituents want them to be. Given that, you have a bulk of both parties who have no interest in compromise. And you add that dynamic with the tiny margins, meaning there's not a lot of uh, comfort margin for legislation to pass. And what we tend to see is just that. Legislation isn't passing in this Congress. Uh, I've been citing this statistic a lot. We looked at the number of bills that were passed in the first session of this Congress. This is the 118th Congress. Uh, if you look at the bills that Congress passed into law in the first session, which is functionally the first year of the two-year congressional term, uh, the Congress passed 31 bills into law. Uh, 31 bills into law could seem like a reasonable amount of legislation to pass, uh, but it is a historically low level uh, compared even to the 217th Congress, which was very bitterly partisan, uh, certainly very heated uh, Congress. Uh, that Congress passed 270 bills into law in the same period. Uh, you compare 270 to 31, it's very clear that this is a very ineffective Congress. They are structurally set up in a way that doesn't allow for compromise. Uh, and with the margins as tight as they are, they can't win on votes either side, frankly, to advance things. So Congress has essentially become functionally gridlocked. Could we go to the next slide, please? So we have this spectrum where Congress is extremely partisan. They are hyper-focused on the elections. Everything is being considered from a messaging point of view. And you add to it the fact that higher education is increasingly in the public view. Can we go to the next slide, please? I'm gonna start by talking about how the public views higher education by starting with some data. And this is pretty basic data. This comes from the College Board. This is the adjusted lifetime earnings by educational outcome. And I like using this slide when I talk about this because what the College Board does here is they say, it's not just the, you know, the earnings gap that you see between different education levels, but they actually account for the cost of college as part of this determination. And they account for the fact that you will have to leave the workforce to get a four-year degree, to get an AA degree. Um, so those factors are counted in. When you make those adjustments and you look over the course of a lifetime, <clears throat> A bachelor's degree recipient will earn, according to the College Board, about $1.35 million. Uh, a high school graduate will earn a little under $900,000. So almost effectively a 50% increase in lifetime earnings, a substantial amount of money uh, over the course of a lifetime. This is in a viewpoint. This is in a perspective. This is just simply the facts. Uh, you will earn more money as you earn as you have earned a higher level of post-secondary uh, credential. There's other things about a uh, higher education outcome that are very positive. The uh, Gallup and uh, the New America Foundation, I believe, I might be getting that source right, trying to remember, but um, did a survey. They looked at 52 different data points that correlated to personal happiness. These were things like employment, uh, home ownership, having children, participating in community organizations, voting, civic engagement, uh, health, uh, longevity. And when you looked at all of those 52 factors, 49 of them positively correlated with increasing levels of education. So whether you are talking financially or just quality of life, indisputably, going to college is very good for you. Can you go to the next slide? And I started with that uh, point about college is indisputably good for you because that's not necessarily what the public sees. 
This is Gallup data. They have done a long running survey of confidence of Americans in, insti in public insti or in institutions generally uh, across a range of institutions. You can see that higher education between 2015 and 2023, public confidence in higher education dropped 21 percentage points in an eight year window. It's a huge drop, certainly when you look relatively to say public schools or a composite of the other nine major US institutions Gallup tracked. Now, I wanna say two things about that um, as we talk about it. One is that in 2015, higher education was the institution that the public had the fourth most confidence in uh, behind small businesses, military, and the police. In 2023, after having fallen 21 percentage points, higher education remained the fourth highest uh, in terms of confidence among the American public behind, again, military, uh, small business and the police. Uh, what we have seen and what this chart shows you is the American public is increasingly skeptical of institutions as a whole. Now, we have seen a precipitous decline in higher education um, beyond what we've seen in other areas, but we are not unique to what is a broad cultural trend of distrust of institutions. Next slide, please. The other thing we have that Certainly, it makes for a challenging environment in terms of advancing the interests of higher education, demonstrating the value of higher education, is that we have a huge adult population, often registered voters, constituents of members of Congress, who have had an experience with higher education where they've attended and left without a credential. Um, 43, over 43 million people who have attended some level of post-secondary education and left their institution without a degree. Uh, when you think about what that experience would look like to those individuals, uh, they probably attended for a short period of time. They probably borrowed or had to forego some other form of, you know, put some money in from other sources. There was a financial implication for them to pursue this. And then they've left without a credential, which means they're not seeing a uh, corresponding gain in their own personal earnings. They have not seen a salary boost as a result of that. When you have 43 or more million people out there voting age who are thinking about my experience with higher education was financially possibly harmful uh, and it certainly was not the outcome I was hoping for when I began. Uh, that is a big group of disenchanted people who will express their views to their representatives. Next slide, please. And so what does that all mean? Put it together, we started out talking about the fact that indisputably, if you look at the data, going to college and getting a degree, is enormously beneficial, but that's not what the public believes. This is not a question about, uh, you know, generally is an education a good thing? This is very specifically, is it worth the cost to get a four-year degree specific to income over a lifetime? We've already seen the data. The data says, yes, there's not really a dispute here, but the public's opinion is quite different. Uh, only 42% of people agree with an idea that is factually correct. The public simply doesn't believe in the value of a higher education. Can you go to the next slide, please? So I've laid out a political climate. I've laid out a popular view of higher education. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how these two things interact and what that means for policymaking. And can we go to the next slide? So I started, uh, my remarks by saying one of the things is that higher education is in the spotlight in ways that it never has been before, um, certainly not in a long time, at least. If you think over the last year and a half about Supreme Court decisions about the consideration of race and admissions, if you think about the Biden administration's ongoing efforts to provide loan forgiveness to student loan borrowers, uh, and then certainly in the moment we're in, campus protests, uh, accusations, concerns around anti-Semitism on college campuses, uh, you put all those things together, all of those are front page news, national TV coverage, round the clock attention in a way that higher education just really isn't used to. Uh, what that means is not just that higher education and academia were paying attention to these things, but the average American is paying attention to those things too. And if they are, their members of Congress are paying attention to that. Can we go to the next slide? And what we have tended to see as the public becomes increasingly concerned about higher education is a real bifurcation between the two parties that's very dependent on what your educational attainment level is. Educational attainment is now one of the biggest predictors of party affiliation you will find. Um, this is, and apologies if it's a little bit hard to read, I know there's a lot of numbers there, 
Uh, but this is a chart looking at the last three federal election cycles and how the vote among college educated voters versus non-college educated voters split. And what you can see is in 2018, there was a 29 percentage point gap between college educated voters and non-college educated voters voting Democratic or versus Republican. That grew to 32% in 2020. Uh, it dropped a little bit to 28% in 2022, although there's some things about the 2022 election cycle, the first election after a new administration, that probably skewed that a little bit. I think when you talk to most experts, you will see that the expectation is in 2024, we're probably seeing an even bigger uh, partisan gap by educational attainment. Can we go to the next slide, please? And what that's meant is as more and more Democrats who are call or more and more as college educated voters vote Democratic and more and more as voters without a college degree vote Republican, we've tended to see that uh, the population has segregated along educational lines across congressional districts. This is data from Politico. They looked at congressional elections coming out of the 2022 election. And what they found was that Democrats represented 77% of the seats with the highest educational attainment levels, whereas Republicans represented 64% of the seats with the lowest levels of educational attainment. And I want to be clear, this is not a point to say that Democrats care about education or Republicans don't care about education. What this means is they tend to both approach education from very different perspectives. If you have a lot of your constituents who went to college, you probably care a lot about student debt. You probably care a lot about loan forgiveness and relieving your constituents of some of that student loan debt. You care about the economic return of a college degree because a lot of your constituents may be concerned with their outcomes. If you're on the Republican side, that doesn't mean you don't care about higher education or post-secondary education. It means that your perspective may be very different. You may be looking at alternate pathways, ways to get training and skills to enter other fields that don't require a degree. You may be looking at how much financial support is provided to uh, college students if your uh, constituents aren't pursuing those degrees. Uh, again, the concerns about quality and outcomes are there for both parties. They just tend to take a very different lens because they've had very different experiences among the people who vote for them. Uh, a really good example, I think, of this is the loan forgiveness uh, issue. Uh, people probably remember when the Biden administration first proposed a very broad-based universal loan forgiveness proposal, there were two sets of arguments from each of the parties. Democrats in support of that were saying, well, if anything, it should be more money. It should be instead of 20,000, it should be 50,000 or all of a student's debts. And this will be great. This, is, this debt is a drag on the economy. Uh, it's preventing people from starting businesses. It's preventing people from getting married, uh, owning homes. Uh, this will be a spur to the economy and it'll be a relief to a lot of borrowers. On the Republican side, a very different reaction uh, for the most part. A lot of times what the argument was, was harken back to that slide about, you know, a college educated individual earns 50% more than someone with just a high school degree. Looking at these are people who make higher incomes. Uh, they're the ones who attended college. They're benefiting from that decision. Why should people who didn't have that economic advantage, who didn't take that choice, have their tax dollars go to pay for that rather than other things that may be of more direct impact to them. Again, there's a lot of concern and interest in the policy outcomes, but from very, very different angles. Can we go to the next slide, please? So I'm going to talk about just one issue that has been dominating uh, basically media attention, but certainly Congress's attention of late. Uh, and can we go to the next slide? And that is the current concern around anti-Semitism and campus protests. Uh, people no doubt have seen, certainly if you are attending this webinar, I'm sure that you have been paying attention to the fact that uh, since October 7th, there have been a variety of demonstrations, protests on college campuses, uh, expressions of either support for Israel or support for the Palestinian people. Um, and those have played out in a lot of different ways. Uh, I'm really not here to talk sort of about those specifically, really more about what that means for federal policy. And it's been a very interesting uh, policy environment, and, and it plays back to a lot of the political trends that I started talking about. Uh, really, in the immediate aftermath of October 7th, you saw a lot of statements from members of Congress, uh, expressions of support, uh, of sympathy, 
Uh, and members of Congress tended to see a strong response. Constituents were paying attention to this. They were engaged. They cared about these issues. There were strong feelings on both sides of this issue. And a lot of people with strong feelings would reach out to their members of Congress to express those feelings. What you also start to see is when you have something that seems to be engaging the public in a way that's uh, very visceral, very strong, and we are in an election year, motivating your base, uh, motivating your constituents to show that you care about them, that you're representing them, uh, takes on added emphasis. So you started to see a lot more attention in terms of actions by members of Congress. Really, the first things we saw, a, a slate of hearings came out uh, end of November, early December. Perhaps the most famous one was the December 5th hearing in the Education Workforce Committee in the House of Representatives, where the presidents of Harvard, Penn, and MIT testified before the committee. Uh, sort of infamously, two of those presidents resigned within about six weeks following that hearing. Uh, and maybe more importantly, from the political perspective, the aftermath of that hearing uh, resounded across media, uh, you know, going so far as being spoofed on Saturday Night Live. This is not something that often happens for congressional hearings. Uh, it's certainly not something that often happens for congressional hearings around higher education policy. Uh, members of Congress on both sides, on both sides of the issue, regardless of party affiliation, noticed this, saw the attention it was getting, and it's led to an increased focus uh, by members on this. Uh, what that's meant is additional investigations by the Education Workforce Committee into institutions' actions, as well as a series of other hearings. We've already seen uh, at the end of April, the president of Columbia was also asked to come up. Uh, this Thursday, the presidents of UCLA, Northwestern, and Rutgers will be appearing before the committee. Um, but also we're seeing action not just in the education committees, but because this is an issue that's resonating with voters, uh, we're seeing it across a range of other areas. And, and just about two weeks ago, Speaker Johnson in the House, uh, flanked by the chairs of a number of congressional committees, announced that they were going to pursue what they called a whole of the house approach to battling anti-Semitism on college campuses. Uh, what that functionally means is committees like the Science Committee will start looking at how research funding is awarded, how grants are awarded. And if institutions that in the committee's opinion, are not doing a sufficient job of protecting students from anti-Semitism, uh, whether they should be allowed to access uh, scientific research grants, whether that should weigh against their eligibility to participate in that funding. Uh, it also means that the Ways and Means Committee, the committee that deals with taxation uh, and taxes in the House, uh, they're looking at the tax exempt status of nonprofit institutions saying, well, if you can't fulfill your obligations to protect your students under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, uh, maybe you shouldn't be uh, exempt from federal taxation. Obviously, huge, impactful thing for institutions. Um, it goes to things like Homeland Security and the State Department, looking at international students who are here on student visas. There is a provision in the uh, requirements around getting a student visa that says you cannot promote or support a terrorist organization. Uh, as a reminder, I think people know, but Hamas is classified as a terrorist organization by the United States. So Members of that committee are asking, if a student shows up at a pro-Palestinian protest, where is the line between saying they're actively promoting or supporting Hamas? Maybe we should be looking more closely at that. Maybe we should be defining that line in a way that starts to lead to international students having their student visas revoked, having them uh, made to leave the country. Uh, that's really what this is, a broad-based approach into all of the interactions higher education has with the federal government particularly around the areas of funding, uh, but in a number of other ways, and, and setting them up for further scrutiny in this regard. Uh, we fully expect that this hearing on Thursday in the Education Committee, these other hearings we've heard about, uh, they will not be the last. Uh, there is a real electoral impact of this. Uh, it is a you know, factor for both parties, and there's a lot of interest politically in keeping this in the public attention. We have seen on college campuses within the last week or so, and I'm knocking wood as I say this, uh, relatively uh, a shift. The tension seemed to have lowered, protests seem to be dispersing as commencements have approached or have passed. Uh, we haven't had the same level of conflict that we'd seen in the preceding few weeks. Certainly, I think the hope is that the summer may cool things down. Uh, that said, the fall when students return to campus, if these issues, particularly since we won't know what is happening in Gaza at that point, 
uh, what that might mean. Uh, and again, the proximity to a early November election, the interest of members of Congress of being heard and being seen to be active in this area uh, will intensify. So a lot more, we might be seeing a lot more attention similar to what we have over the last few months. The one thing, as I talk about this, that you probably haven't heard me say is anything about legislation. And that's because Congress really hasn't done much in terms of legislation. Uh, we are tracking at ACE 11 bills and two amendments that touch on the issue of campus protest or campuses handling of anti-Semitism. Uh, of those, only one of them has had a floor vote, has moved through the various subcommittees and committees and gone to the floor of a chamber uh, for a vote. This is the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, H.R. 6090. Uh, that bill skipped the committee process, went directly to the floor, and did receive a, it was approved by the House of Representatives in an overwhelmingly bipartisan fashion. Uh, it is a relatively a narrow bill. What it does is say that the Office of Civil Rights at the Department of Education, which is the office that does the investigations of colleges and universities, uh, that that office should consider uh, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism. Uh, so generally not strong language, uh, not a must, uh, it says it should. It's also not particularly clear in terms of what the implications might be. And there are certainly concerns by some, uh, particularly free speech proponents, uh, that using this definition, uh, particularly the examples that were included in it that provide contemporary examples of how you might interpret actions as being anti-Semitic, uh, may lead to a conflation of criticisms of the government of Israel with anti-Semitism, so may have the possibility of a chilling effect on speech on a campus. Um, that bill, as I said, passed the House. There was a lot of thought that anything passing with big bipartisan margins generally uh, gets an easy passage in the other chamber. We were expecting to see that bill go to the Senate. Uh, so far, it has not. Uh, a number of concerns have come up. And not that all of this is political, it certainly isn't, but some of those are political concerns. Uh, Representative Jerry Nadler of New York uh, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times where he talked about the fact that uh, on this issue, Republicans in his perception are using it as a wedge issue against Democrats to split the moderate and progressive wings of the Democratic Party. Uh, that idea of the factionalism, the differences across the, you know, the members within the same party, uh, he highlighted that as a problem Democrats face in dealing with legislation like this as part of a number of other concerns he raised. So what we have tended to see is in the Senate, which is controlled by the Democratic Party, uh, less of an interest in bringing this bill forward. Does not mean it will not move forward, uh, but it does mean that some of the momentum we saw earlier through the House uh, doesn't seem to have carried over. Can we go to the next slide, please? And I talked about the protests I think it's instructive to sort of have a visual of where exactly the protests are happening. I think uh, certainly as I begin to turn it over to Heidi, it's also worth keeping this in mind. We are talking about, in many ways, the political implications of this. And if you look at where the protests tend to happen, certainly a heavy concentration in the Northeast, along the West Coast, uh, some more across areas in the Midwest, but it sort of follows an electoral map that tends to align with uh, where there's democratic representation. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, and I'll actually probably just skip through this because I've touched on a lot of this, but I'll go through the administration side. Uh, because of the location of where these protests are happening, because of the concentration, particularly at highly selective institutions, uh, you've tended to see some callback to those divides among constituencies. Again, if you are Democrats in these areas, these are institutions within your district. You're also tending to represent a lot of college educated voters. Your perception of what's going on on those campuses may look very different than Republicans who are not representing those areas. And again, who a large number of their constituents did not go to college. Your views of what's going on there, obviously, as we've seen from the, the questioning from opponents, much more critical, uh, much more uh, questioning of how college and university presidents and senior leaders have responded to these issues, uh, much more skeptical of their commitment to protecting uh, their Jewish students and their Jewish staff. Uh, so it has tended to play out in a very direct uh, way in terms of what we've seen in Congress, these political implications. Uh, I do want to touch on what the administration has done. Uh, it has frankly had been far less uh, public attention to the administration's efforts. Uh, the administration in many ways is trying to balance those same concerns we talked about between their progressive constituencies and their moderate constituencies. 
Uh, also, different views, young voters feel very differently about these issues than older voters, and young voters are a key to the Biden administration's reelection effort. Uh, so what you have tended to see is a very balanced approach from the administration. They have launched a large number of investigations in response to complaints they've heard into colleges and universities. Uh, at this point, I believe they're at 145 investigations currently open uh, around issues of anti-Semitism. Those are at both the K-12 and the higher education level, but the overwhelming majority are at colleges and universities. The administration has also put out a lot of additional guidance, including just a few weeks ago, a dear colleague letter that's about 18 pages and include a number of examples of uh, incident, uh, types of behavior that could be considered anti-Semitic would be seen as violating uh, Title VI. And then the administration has recently announced that they're working across uh, eight different agencies, eight different cabinet level agencies to provide expanded resources across the country. Some of these are things like uh, opening federal funding programs uh, to a broader range of constituencies. So letting K-12 schools or libraries or community centers or colleges, universities, or synagogues access security funding made available through federal sources. Uh, some of it is coordinating efforts and resources on federal websites. The Department of Homeland Security is going to create a unified center in opposition to anti-Semitism. Uh, some of it is doing things like reaching out to the major social media companies and looking at ways to proactively uh, screen and bar anti-Semitic comments, uh, content, sorry. Uh, so the administration very actively engaged as well, far less uh, loudly publicly in sort of the way we've seen in Congress, uh, but pursuing their own goals, trying to strike that balance where they can. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? And so I've talked a lot about at the federal level. I think it's certainly, as you've seen, has not really played out in terms of actual impact on institutions, but that I think is very, very different than what we are seeing at the state level. And so I'll turn it over to my colleague, Heidi, to talk a little bit more about that. Thanks, John. So as John said, we move from an area where legislation tends not to move to the state context, where somewhere some type of legislation is likely moving. Um, as shared earlier, my name is Heidi Sue, and I'm the Assistant Vice President for National Engagement at the American Council on Education. Can we go to the first slide, please? The National Engagement Office at ACE is relatively new. We officially launched last fall, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity today to join you all here and share some background on why ACE is focusing on national engagement work, what we seek to accomplish, and some examples of how we plan to approach the work. As you saw from John's presentation, ACE has had a longstanding and highly developed federal relations office that serves as the coordinator and key voice on federal matters in higher ed. ACE's leadership was closely tracking the growing trend of state-based policy challenges impacting higher education across the country and recognized that the breadth and pervasiveness of this trend necessitated a sustained and comprehensive response on behalf of higher education as a whole. As a result, my office launched last October and we are tasked with designing and implementing a strategy for ACE to impact these state policy discussions on the role and value of higher education. Can we go to the next slide, please? So we've all seen the headlines on state policies across the US that have targeted DEI in higher education. These legislative policy approaches have typically restricted or banned DEI leadership offices, spending, prohibitions against diversity statements, and elimination of programs that benefit certain identities. This is a map of new state limitations on diversity, equity, and inclusion in higher education from earlier this year. And although we are approaching summer recess for many state legislatures, this map is more illustrative because policies are continuously shifting. What's striking here is more the overall spread as a proxy for how the landscape of DEI in higher education across the country is visibly changing. And so I'd like to make three observations here. The pace of state policy can be incredibly fast. Advocacy efforts, policies, and momentum move quickly across state borders. 
especially in the past few years where it's increasingly difficult to move policy at the federal level, advocates on all sides are seeing the value of a state-by-state -state strategy in order to implement national goals. This is not limited to DEI policies in higher education. My second point is that we are facing a wide range of growing policy challenges to higher education as a whole. Related issues include challenges to accreditation, faculty tenure, curriculum, post-secondary administration, and the overall cultural climate in which our institutions sit. And my third point is that these challenges are symptomatic of a much larger issue for higher education that is not going away. At the state level, we can see the enactment of specific bills in this graphic, but what is less visible, but also very much present, is the aftermath of these state policies and national trends that are impacting our institutions, regardless of politics, the state in which they sit, or even institution type. We are seeing a chilling effect on administration and leadership, restrictions on discourse, and overall changes to the narrative around higher education, something that will require all of us to pay close attention. Can you go to the next slide, please? And as we think through the most effective way for ACE to engage on these state policy matters and support our broad membership, our approach is threefold. Advocate. As a national organization, it was immediately apparent that ACE would not be lobbying in every state. All politics are local, and we strongly believe that involvement at that level must be finely tailored in order to align with our member institutions and any existing on-the-ground work. Instead, ACE's primary focus is on collective empowerment across all of our higher ed institutions. How do we both support all our members so they can advocate for themselves across a diversity of topics? And how do we spark innovation so that all our members are able to proactively and strategically engage with their states and communities? We wanna create a community across higher education and higher ed partners external to our industry that seek to engage in state policy. Again, the federal higher education community across the country is relatively well-defined. At the state level, there's incredible potential already within our institutions to engage and influence relationships with our state electeds, our state organizations, and our community members. Here, our National Engagement Office wants to focus on creating an active network of higher ed partners engaged on state matters to help inform each of us on best practices, issue alerts, and share lessons learned. And finally, a key component is education. A key component of this strategy is to do what higher ed does best by strategically advocating across our entire broad higher ed community the aggregate results of our efforts will be to collectively educate our key partners in states and communities and affirm and strengthen the public trust and awareness about the overall role and value of higher education. Here, we wanna leverage ACE's research and data expertise to strategically support our members' advocacy and engagement. This is where all of us, regardless of where you sit at an institution, have the potential to make a difference. Can we go to the next slide, please? And finally, I'd love to share some of our early thinking about specific projects at National Engagement because we are actively seeking feedback and partnerships with ACE to engage in this work. So since our launch this fall, we've been reaching out to organizations and individuals, both internal and external to higher ed, in order to share our work, but more importantly, to hear from our member institutions and potential partners, how they engage their states and how we might support. We partnered with PEN America to develop a resource guide on academic freedom and institutional autonomy state executives on an accreditation toolkit designed for state legislators and those external to higher ed, and data snapshots to distill complex issues into advocacy points. In our second bucket, we are seeking targeted partnership initiatives. 
For example, we are forming small issue-based consortiums of experts that will forge transparency and understanding on complex matters such as diversity, healthcare, and access on campus. We are intentionally reaching beyond the higher education community to government, business communities, scientific communities, and community groups in order to grow this work. An example here is ACE co-founding the Freedom to Learn Network along with PEN America, a coalition of organizations beyond just higher ed that are focused on state policies, challenging DEI, academic freedom, and institutional autonomy in the context of higher ed. And in our third bucket, we have launched a webinar series called Advancing Higher Education in Our States to have our growing community members tell the story of how they have strategically and proactively engaged with their states. Our second webinar is tomorrow at 12 p.m. and we are really excited to partner with AACSB, the Association to Advance Collegiate Schools of Business, to highlight the quote business case for higher ed to engage their states and leverage business education for positive societal impact. So I'd be happy to leave the rest of our time for any questions or feedback or discussion. Thank you very much for the time today to share. Thank you, John, and thank you, Heidi. I do want to remind our audience that questions can be submitted through the Q&A function on your Zoom toolbar, and we have plenty of time uh, for John and Heidi to consider your questions. So go ahead and start placing them into that Q&A function that you see on your screen. I, I know we have a few questions already, and so I don't know, uh, John, if you want to address it or Heidi, but obviously the rollout of the new FAFSA has created challenges for institutions and students. So where do things stand and how has ACE been assisting its members with this? Challenges is a very nice euphemism to use for what we've seen out of the FAFSA implementation process so far. Um, it really has been uh, a pretty disastrous launch to the simplified form and the changes to financial aid eligibility. Um, and maybe that's the place to start, right? The reason why all of this took place uh, and what we're hopeful for, the form itself for uh, people, it's working for most people now and it is shorter and faster. Uh, people have reported good experiences uh, when they've been able to get it to work, uh, which is a much more consistent experience now. And the projections are that a lot more students will be eligible for financial aid and a lot more students, uh, low income students, will receive more aid uh, going forward as a result of these changes. That said, uh, it has been very bumpy. Uh, I won't go through the whole history. I'm sure people on campuses are probably more familiar with it than I am. But uh, really, up until a few weeks ago, we were probably at the lowest point. Uh, there were large percentages of the information that the Department of Education was sending to schools was incorrect, uh, estimates as high as 40%. Um, there was not a process for people who had applied and then made errors in their applications to correct those. Uh, luckily, that has turned around. Uh, the department has corrected all of that data. Colleges should now be receiving the full uh, roster of student information uh, that they uh, should be receiving, and that information should be accurate. Uh, there is a functionality for applicants to correct mistakes that were made when they applied. Uh, so really, we're at the point where we should have been at the start, which is the system is working uh, fully functionally and the correct information is going to campuses to allow them to package aid offers to students. Um, the problem that we're really dealing with as a result of all these delays and all of these problems that went forward is that it's had a huge impact on the number of low-income students who have been applying. Uh, compared to the same time last year, 17% uh, fewer completed FAFSA applications than we saw at the same time last year. Uh, that's a significant jump, almost one in five uh, drop in applicants. And again, these are low-income students. These are uh, disproportionately first-generation students, students of color, uh, the kinds of students that we often struggle to reach and to get to access higher education, the kinds of students who benefit uh, so much from an experience in higher education. So Really a big concern with that. The good news on that front is that number, that 17% number is dropping and has been dropping pretty rapidly. It was about 40% uh, around three weeks ago. There's been a real surge 
uh, and a lot of community groups. I know a lot of uh, certainly uh, middle states members and others working with their community to encourage students to make to fill out the application. Uh, Department of Education has put $50 million through a contractor of theirs out to help community groups do outreach efforts and, and get students, especially while they're still enrolled in high school, to work with their counselors, put an application. And so everything is moving in the right direction for this year. It's just that it's starting far later than it should have. And again, I don't think I need to tell this audience, the big problem is when you look at those declines in enrollment numbers, you look at the delays and in information going out to students, trying to figure out what that will mean for what your class on your campus looks like for the next year uh, is very, very hard to do. And we have certainly heard from a lot of our institutions that the level of uncertainty about what their class will look like, what that means for institutional revenues, their ability to make contracts with outside vendors to support their students, serve their students' needs, uh, everything is up in the air. It is a chaotic year, unlike anything we've seen uh, before. So there is some good news, obviously, uh, but a lot of unanswered questions. I think we are expecting pretty negative outcomes. It's just a matter at this point of whether enough can be done to minimize uh, the harm. Thanks, John. Heidi, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I just add that at the state level, there are initiatives that we're seeing in certain jurisdictions in order to address the gaps that are becoming more apparent. And so I spoke earlier about, again, as we design the outreach and tools that our office will be utilizing, that a lot of this is about sort of that broader support of our institutions and less so about directly involving ourselves in state legislative policies. However, I do think there are areas where ACE can be helpful when it comes to spurning these types of national conversations, where there is a benefit to that uniformity across states. I would just mention that um, Nick Anderson joined the ACE leadership team relatively recently. Um, he's going to be, he's our vice president for higher education partnerships and improvement and has already started some resources and engagement in that sense around the FAFSA resource page and active partnerships with organizations that are leading in this space like NCAN. And so we're exploring possibilities around work where national engagement can partner with other organizations in order to see where we can advance the ball on this issue. Thank you both. Turning your attention back to advocacy. Uh, we have a question for you to reflect on what are the top three issues that our audience members or our presidents should prioritize and how do they do that in an environment where policy shifts are moving so quickly? It's such a good question and there are so many answers, frankly, I could give. I would, and Heidi and I actually were talking about something along these lines earlier today. Um, and I, I will say, and, and I think Heidi agrees, but she'll share her perspective. You know, to my mind, first and foremost, uh, all of these things we are seeing in at the both the state and the federal level start with this question about the value proposition of higher education. And you know, I often say, if you weren't seeing fifty six percent of the public saying a four year degree isn't worth it anymore, you probably wouldn't see as much concern about how colleges and universities handle protests on their campus, right? A lot of these concerns with higher education arise in part because <clears throat> there isn't confidence in institutions and there is a concern about the work that we do and the value of it. I think if you had a uniform kind of popular support for the idea of higher education uh, that we saw 15, 20, 30 you know, years going back, um, some of these issues that flare up uh, probably wouldn't flare up and they wouldn't, if they did, they wouldn't flare up quite as brightly. Uh, that said, you know, the things that we certainly hear the most from our members about, and I know Heidi and I will have different experiences in that regard, but the ones I hear the most from our members about, certainly uh, the boundary between free speech and protecting students' civil rights, uh, as that relates to campus protests and anti-Semitism, other issue areas, how that's playing out on college campuses, the FAFSA implementation, which we've already talked about, and certainly the implications of that for next year and our student bodies. Uh, in institutional revenues. Uh, and then I think the funding environment that we are seeing a, a very tough federal funding environment. We're going through two years of essentially flat funding. And you look at a lot of programs that 
you know, whether it's something that helps provide daycare for student parents or it's Pell Grant funding, uh, we are entering an environment that's going to be very, very hard to not just, you know, uh, stay level, uh, but to not to fight off cuts. And the idea of getting increases is going to be very, very challenging, even though we know with inflation and many other things, there's real needs across those programs. So uh, a big, big slate of things, I would say also certainly always encourage you to reach out to your members of Congress and express uh, your concerns about the need for additional support uh, and, and talk about what your campus does, uh, how these things play out on your campus. Let them see the experiences you have. That's really actually very helpful in helping them reach ideas about how they want to advance legislation, how they want to vote on different things, how they frankly want to talk about colleges and universities when they're in the chamber. So uh, certainly encourage people to do that. But Heidi, you might have a very different top three than me. I I think it's interesting, right, because of the distinction between federal and, and state strategies here. And, and I think this is a perfect question to sort of highlight that. Um, I would approach it differently in that it's not necessarily about a top three issue list. It is state legislation is so dynamic. It is so fast. It is kind of unpredictable in a certain sense um, because it is so close to the ground that if you are trying to focus on a specific issue or topic, you are probably already too late. I would argue that in this context, national engagement is trying to encourage states or state institutions and institutions in higher ed to partner and converse early on in the process, because by the time a bill has been introduced, those conversations are, have already happened. And so our thinking is, when you have these relationships, when you diagnose how it is that your institution sits in the context of your state, your electeds, your business community, your residential community, what are sort of the levers and pulleys that make sense for your institution in its unique position to actively reach out and strategically build mutually beneficial relationships with these state governments and state electeds? That's when you're in the room and these conversations will pop up over coffee or a discussion about a completely different topic. And that is how you are going to be able to engage early and often in order to not let it get potentially to the point where a bill is already on the floor and being looked at for passage. So I, I, would, I would go that direction. Um, and I would think that that's something that we're hoping to encourage other partners to be doing and also sharing this information across networks, as we also see that some of these policies are sort of sparking across borders. And so it's possible to get earlier alerts about advocacy organizations or movements that may have been born in one state but are coming to your jurisdiction as well. And there are lessons to be learned from that from our broader community. What you have shared during the presentation and in response to the questions, how do you envision that the higher education shifts, whether that's closures, mergers, acquisitions, just mobility in terms of changes, in institutional administration or having policy or practical implications from uh, and influencing some of what you're seeing? Well, I, I think there's really a micro and a macro level response there that we've seen. The micro level one is, is pretty easy and pretty direct to talk about. Um, certainly uh, this administration and previous administrations have been concerned about uh, what federal policy looks like for change of control at institutions, uh, starting with really a wave of proprietary institutions converting to nonprofit status, <clears throat> excuse me, either through ac acquiring nonprofit institutions or changing their status themselves. Uh, and we're seeing a rulemaking that just concluded from the beginning of this year that had a lot of language about what are the circumstances under which that would be allowed. Uh, the Department of Education has had rulings on uh, efforts to convert status or to uh, acquire other institutions. They're really driven by a handful of examples that have gotten the most public attention. Certainly, you think about uh, sort of the Purdue Global and Kaplan and, and other examples in that area. Um, so 
there, there's a very clear interest by this Department of Education in setting stricter lines, allowing for a stronger review period, uh, setting certain criteria as to what control looks like after a change in status or a merger, uh, who is benefiting from that, what are the contractual relationships. So we may see coming out of this rulemaking, uh, a very different uh, regulatory environment for how those actual transactions occur. Macro level, I think, is something actually that we are spending a lot of time thinking about because one of the reasons we have seen so many of these mergers, so many of these, you know, uh, where one institution will acquire another institution is because of the environment for especially small tuition dependent private institutions. And this isn't news to anyone here, but we are in the midst of a continuing enrollment decline. Uh, that is particularly true when you look demographically at the Northeast and the Upper Midwest. Uh, those are areas with declining ages of high school uh, students coming through the pipeline, and that looks to continue for a long time. Uh, because those enrollment numbers are declining, you are seeing greater financial pressures on institutions. We're also seeing, frankly, greater financial pressures on institutions from requirements imposed by the federal government, by other factors out there that make operating especially a smaller institution more challenging, uh, certainly even more pronounced in rural areas. So there are a lot of factors broadly that are impacting where students go and what kinds of institutions are, are really able to survive these shifts in demographics around them. Uh, what do you do about that? Uh, you know, certainly we have seen some very uh, proactive approaches, looking for partnerships, sharing costs, other things schools are doing really thoughtful and creative ways to ensure that their students are getting the educations they need uh, and that the institution's bottom lines are protected, but it is a very difficult environment. I don't want to downplay that at all. So, you know, we have seen less and we at ACE and our colleague associations are thinking a lot about where can the federal government step in to support these institutions in some way pandemic era relief may have masked the problem for a few years with the direct support to institutions. We're now being to see that come back. Uh, we do think there's a role for the federal government in helping here, uh, ensuring that good institutions certainly uh, are, are able to meet their students' needs. What that will look like, uh, well, that's a big question and, and certainly a lot of different ways it could play out, but, but that is something we are spending a lot of time on. Thanks, John. Heidi, did you want to add anything? I think John's covered it. All right. Well, uh, John, you know, you got the crowd excited with references to negotiated rulemaking. <laughs> and so I have to put uh, some questions on the table for you around uh, the negotiated rulemaking that um, just concluded. And what do you envision uh, to happen next? And how can audience members get involved? And then more broadly, what are you seeing relating to uh, accreditation in particular? Yes, and, and it's just a little bit of context here. I mentioned there was an, uh, a negotiated rulemaking session uh, that concluded in March. The was, consensus was only reached on a small handful of the issues before the committee. Uh, all of the major issues, uh, there was no consensus, which means the department has a relatively free hand to write the regulations as they desire. Um, I will say that this particular package of uh, regulations is problematic from our perspective. First, you start with the fact that we are in a moment where colleges and universities will need to come into compliance with a brand new Title IX regime that includes requirements on training all of your staff, and you need to be into compliance by August 1st. The Department of Labor's overtime rules goes into effect, the first piece of it, on July 1st. So schools need to be in compliance with that, which will impact how you staff and what you pay your employees. The gainful employment, financial value, transparency requirements, huge data reporting requirements on institutions, a number of other changes as to how you collect and report data, uh, and certainly then the down the road implications of what that data will be used to calculate relative to your institution. Those go into effect July 1st. There's a really crushing weight of a lot of big regulatory efforts coming into effect. And then when you look at possibly the summer or fall, a whole range of new issues coming in place. You know, I, I feel very, very bad for campus administrators. Any one of these would be an enormous task to try to accommodate in it. In these short periods of time, uh, colleges are being given, uh, all of them at the same time with very broad implications. Uh, it, it is very difficult. 
In terms of accreditation, accreditation was specifically one of the five topics that the negotiated rulemaking covered. And again, you know, I said, this is problematic. It really is. A lot of the things in this rulemaking, I'll say, and, and I've said this publicly before, looks to be solving a problem that doesn't exist. Uh, there are proposed requirements on accreditors that you can't have more than 50% of your board uh, be senior campus leaders. So you would have to have a board that's comprised primarily of people who don't have direct experience running an institution, don't understand sort of the unique challenges involved in making those determinations. Uh, there are, would be new requirements that the department proposed around site visits, uh, which would significantly increase the number of locations accreditors would have to visit. You know, we at AC talk about, we have a member who has 150 uh, sites, uh, primarily because they do a lot of support to active duty military. So they are located at times on bases in, you know, maybe not active combat zones, but certainly adjacent to active combat zones. The idea that we need to send accreditation review groups out to all of these locations, the enormity of the cost imposed, the enormity of the difficulty, how much it will delay the accreditation review process. Uh, the trade-off for that, it's very hard to understand what the department sees as the benefit of that trade-off. Um, you know, there are a number of other things along those lines. It all goes back really to this idea, you know, again, of ensuring, I sound like a broken record, but the value of higher education, ensuring the quality of it. Accreditors are squarely in, uh, you know, the sites because they are the gatekeepers of Title IV aid. There is certainly, because Congress can't pass legislation, setting up stricter accountability measures, requirements on the institutions themselves, or telling the Department of Education how to do different things, uh, the Department of Education is going about it through this regulatory approach and, and trying to tighten the screws on institutions and trying to use accreditors to accomplish their policy goals. It is a very, very difficult environment, uh, one that we are, uh, as I've mentioned several times, very concerned about. Uh, the final thing I'll say is we don't know when these regulations will come out or which of the five may be released. Uh, the general timing uh, concern here is if the regulations are in place before November 1st, that means they can go into effect next July 1st. Uh, if they are not in place by November 1st, then they would have to wait another year to July of 2026 to take effect, given that we may have a different administration in charge, uh, one that probably sees a lot of these regulations very differently than the current administration does. Uh, there will probably be some interest in moving up the time frame for getting those regulations out. That said, we're also running up to an election. There has been an enormous amount of regulatory activity. The department is still struggling not just to deal with the problems within the FAFSA implementation of this year, but prepare for next year's uh, award cycle, which they're already behind on because of the problems. There's not just a lot happening at the Department of Education and the idea that they're going to be able to draft, review comments, finalize a very complicated set of rules across five different big impactful issue areas with everything else going on and an election looming. Seems a little hard to believe, but you know, uh, this is an administration that has big ambitions and then so far uh, aggressively pursued those in the regulatory space. So I certainly wouldn't count out their ability to do just that. John, can you just remind our audience if proposed rules are released, how they can be involved in that process? It's it's a great question. One I should have mentioned on my own. Thanks, Heather. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with this process, and shame on you if you're not following the negotiated rulemaking process at the Department of Education. Uh, I said the most fun part of federal uh, policy making. Uh, the way it works is after the negotiators, uh, the committee meets across their meetings over the three months, uh, the department goes back and takes the feedback they got ostensibly and then writes the regulations uh, to reflect the discussions that occurred among the negotiators. At some point, those proposed regulations that the department's written go to the Office of Management and Budget at the White House. Uh, where they're reviewed uh, for a variety of things, uh, make sure they comport with the law, make sure they align with the administration's policies and goals. Uh, and when they are reached the, the seal of approval from uh, the Office of Management Budget, they are sent back to the agency, in this case, the Department of Education, which then will publish what is a proposed final rule. At that point, they will open a comment period 
which the public can submit their comments on the proposed rules. Uh, those comment periods can be uh, really any length of time, but they generally tend to be in 30-day increments, usually 30 or 60 days. Uh, 30 days is a relatively short period of time, but if you are worried about negative comments or you're trying to move things quickly, uh, often we will see a 30-day comment period. Uh, during that time, members of the public, as I mentioned, can file comments with the Department of Education. I want to emphasize actually how useful and valuable the comment process is. Department of Education is required by law to consider every comment that is submitted. And unlike the legislative process in Congress, where it can be hard to see how your voice directly translates into an impact, uh, the Department of Education does have to look at every single comment. They have to answer every single comment when they put their final rule out. Um, they do historically, and, and we've seen this in practice with this department, they do take into account informed uh, comments from people who are working in these fields, who are experts in these areas, uh, people like the people participating in this webinar. So as you think about what this may mean for you in terms of your all, whether it's an accreditor or on a campus, um, putting those comments in is very, very important. It can help shape what the final regulations look like. We may not be able to stop the regulations, we may not be able to necessarily <clears throat> uh, significantly redirect what they're doing, but we can make a lot of the, the actual final regulations improved, uh, certainly by showing the kinds of informed comments that we get from our members and that we strive to submit. AC always puts in comments on behalf of, <clears throat> excuse me, again, uh, us and our members and our colleague associations. Uh, we put a lot of time and thought and effort into that process. Uh, but really hearing from people on a campus specifically is it has a real impact. And so I would encourage all of you to do that when these come out. Absolutely. Those are great reminders for those familiar and a great introduction for those who may be new to this process. Obviously, we have interest in several questions on gainful employment, as well as the financial value transparency. Can you talk a little bit more about those areas as well as provide any resources that ACE may have for those that are listening? Yes, in, in terms of the resources, I'll answer that first. <clears throat> Excuse me again. Um, we have uh, summaries of the regulations up on our website. We have the letters with our comments that we submitted uh, at every stage of those regulations as well as uh, historically around gainful employment as well. Uh, so uh, pretty fulsome coverage of what the issues are, the concerns we've identified, uh, what they may mean for campuses. Uh, for people who are not familiar, uh, gainful employment and financial value transparency grows out of an effort that was put forward in the Obama administration. Uh, they produced regulations uh, purporting to uh, identify the quality of programs that led to gainful employment. Uh, there is not really much statutory. Usually regulations are a law is passed. How do we implement that law? That's what the regulations do. Uh, there wasn't really any new law that changed gainful employment. In fact, the reference in the Higher Education Act to gainful employment is basically one sentence. It doesn't have a lot of details. But what grew out that it was an effort in the Obama administration to look at the outcomes of programs that are gainful employment programs which means all programs at proprietary institutions and non-degree programs at nonprofit institutions, so primarily certificate programs, and assess essentially by using a debt to earnings ratio, whether those programs are delivering good outcomes for their students. Uh, that was enacted finally after a number of court challenges in 2014 at the Department of Education. The Trump administration essentially uh, let that lapse. They did not enforce it. Uh, they did do an expanded college scorecard, which had greater data, especially around programmatic outcomes uh, than we saw before in the college scorecard. But the enforcement around gainful employment uh, mostly dropped off under the Trump administration. The Biden administration came in and resurrected the gainful employment model. Uh, <clears throat> but in addition, they expanded it to all of those programs that weren't covered under gainful employment. Uh, so gainful employment uh, under the Biden administration, it still has that debt to earnings component, uh, but they added a second test, which is a earnings premium. Essentially, does your program uh, produce $1 more in earnings 
uh, for its graduates than the average earnings of a high school graduate age 18 to 34 in your state. If your gainful employment program doesn't pass either of those two tests two times out of three years, that program loses access to Title IV aid. On the financial value transparency side, uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, these regulations look at the same sorts of tests. They apply them to all the other programs that aren't covered by gainful employment, so degree programs primarily at nonprofit institutions. They don't have statutory authority to deny Title IV aid to those programs, so the penalties are somewhat different. What happens in those cases is if your program fails those tests and you're not a gainful program, you're, say, a uh, master's in uh, history, if you fail that test in any, either of those two tests in any one year, before your students can receive Title IV aid, they have to sign an acknowledgement saying that they understand that the program has had a history of poor financial outcomes for their students, and that knowing that they are so willingly pursuing using their, their financial aid at that institution to continue in that program. The goal really by the department is to divert students away from the programs where they have seen the greatest amount of borrowing and the greatest amount of uh, debt growth that they're concerned about, which is fundamentally master's programs. Uh, so they are trying to disincentivize borrowers from going to master's programs, uh, certainly ones that they think don't have good financial returns. What goes along with all that, as you can guess, <laughs> given the fact that it looks at the outcomes of every single program at every single institution, uh, exempting a few that are small enough that they fall below a privacy threshold is an enormous amount of reporting by colleges and universities. And to give them the ability to start making eligibility determinations going forward, they want multiple preceding years worth of data as well. So uh, part of the problem with this is that the Department of Education hasn't <clears throat> fully defined all the terms they are using. They haven't made it abundantly clear yet. Uh, exactly the kinds of information, the form it needs to be reported in. Uh, as a result, there are a lot of panicked institutional researchers on campuses who are trying to figure out multiple years worth of data disaggregated at the programmatic level. Uh, how do they report what? Where do they divide out the data? What are the privacy suppression levels they're supposed to be following? Uh, you know, myriad questions that make this unclear all against the backdrop of a July 1st reporting requirement deadline. I say July 1st, the Department of Education heard a lot of the concerns about this deadline. They did delay the reporting component of those regulations back to October 1st, three month delay. It's not a huge amount of time, but certainly any time is uh, appreciated. Uh, but it's also worth noting that the regulations themselves still take effect July 1st. It is purely the reporting piece that is delayed. Uh, and in large part, it's delayed because of the fast implementation, which has caused such problems on campuses that many of the people who would be compiling the information you would need to report are being tasked with trying to address FAFSA problems that have come up. Great. So I'm going to head over to Heidi and ask her, uh, as we begin to wrap things up, thinking about a key takeaway that you would like to leave with the audience, uh, what are some final remarks that you would want to share? Thanks, Heather. I, I think I would add to the conversation in general, as we continue to sort of hyper-focus on this value proposition of higher education, that that's really central to this idea of us collectively working on what is happening across the country, which are just these challenges to higher ed, I think democracy as a whole, um, that are popping up in a variety of different ways. And so I would invite anybody who is interested in learning more about advocacy at the state level or interest in partnering with ACE to please reach out to me, our office. We would love to start talking with more and more partners about how we can support work that's happening at the ground level. Because even if you think it's not relevant to the overall conversation, every little bit of higher ed's presence in our communities across this country is going to make a difference when it comes to this overall perception of how we fit within our larger community. So I just want to thank you for having the opportunity to join today and talk a little bit about our office as we're launching some of these new programs and really welcome feedback and outreach from any potential partners. 
Well, it was great to have you, Heidi. And, and so, John, these are incredibly complex issues. And as you said, we're seeing regulatory whiplash. Um, so what key takeaways could you leave the audience with around what, where do they start? How best to approach uh, all of what you shared today? Well, I think the first thing is certainly it's going to require a lot of coordination across the campus. And I know that uh, campuses, like lots of organizations, can be a little siloed at times, but there's going to be requirements that will mean that the business officers and the general counsels and the CIOs and the financial aid folks, the institutional researchers are all going to have to be working together. So certainly, uh, if you haven't already started looking at these regulations and what's required and who you need to be talking to to, to meet your obligations, uh, you know, you should be doing that. I think the other side of the of your question is a little bit, how do we look at this policy environment? And what do we do to help uh, shape it? And I would go back to your very good question about the NEGREG process and the rulemaking process. Um, I, I want to emphasize again, this is a really kind of special part of democracy where the voice of individuals and not just institutions, but individuals working on an institution uh, carries a greater weight in a lot of ways than it does in other places in federal policymaking. So you should absolutely be talking to your members of Congress. You should be talking to the people who represent you about the work you do, the importance of it, the challenges you face. Uh, but as you see all of these different regulations being proposed, coming forward, uh, sharing your voice about what that means, what the possible costs your campus are, what the possible burdens your campus are, you know, where you see benefits too, um, you know, but putting forward your views uh, to help inform a process so it better reflects what actually is the reality at our campuses. So uh, encourage folks to look uh, into that. Uh, certainly also helps make my job easier, the more voices we have in those areas. So uh, a little personal plea there too, but uh, I, I think it is the sort of thing that you'll feel very satisfied with as you see the kinds of changes made in response to public comment. Well, thanks to you both. I know we're going to go to the next slide as we begin to wrap up the program for today. I certainly want to remind our audience of our 2024 annual conference with the theme Protecting the Future Champions for Higher Education. That conference will take place December 11th through the 13th in Philadelphia, and we are certainly planning an exciting program. Uh, we will have our uh, usual inspiring plenary speakers, uh, concurrent sessions. We have a luncheon with our chief executive officers and our commission, and we have bre breakfast speakers uh, delivering important information to our presidents, provosts, and accreditation liaison officers. I, I do want to note our call for student poster session proposals will open uh, here in August on August 1st, and we look forward to hosting our student scholars uh, who join us at the conference, and we are really proud of the work that we do with our students and to feature them among our nearly 1,500 uh, audience participants at our conference. So please encourage your students to consider our conference, and please consider joining us in December as well, and you can find out more about our conference at our website. Finally, I want to thank uh, John and Heidi certainly appreciate uh, the partnership that our commission has with ACE and certainly appreciate how willing you both were uh, to come and join us today. It's been a great program. I know that those who have tuned in with us for the afternoon have taken away some great insights and most importantly, have taken away some critical work that they can begin uh, as well at their campuses with their colleagues. So thank you both. Thank you to ACE uh, for advocating for higher education policies that meet the needs of our community and most importantly of our students. So thank you both. And that does conclude our program today.